It is Kansas City in blue, DC United in black. This one, the ninth edition of MLS Cup, is underway. So take his cross, lost there, but Nelson with a quick recovery and clearance. Borciaga lets it go from distance. Borciaga scores, beating Romano from downtown. And what a goal that was. The second that he got the ball, DC United just kind of backed up. You can't do that. You can see from Nick Romano's angle, he was a little bit screened, but this is just a blast. You see the knuckling right there? It's going to go right in that far corner. That's very difficult for a goalkeeper to get you. What a change to this game. That was unexpected. This is a guy that didn't score a goal during the regular season. Comes up big here with an early goal. This is way out there. That is just a blast that you know, on, on most occasions a goalkeeper would make the save on that. DC pushing it up on the turn. Quick shot is Gennarian. It's tied. All year round. Post up. Gets on that left foot. That is his strength. And you cannot hit a ball any better than that. You know, this, this game has become a battle of one-on-ones, which is to the advantage of Kansas City, but Aleko Eskandarian just won that one. You can see it better from this angle. He gets that turn. Great touch. That's his strength. Another knuckleball in the upper corner. Now, you, you can't fault Bo Shawnee on that one. That was just a great shot. He cleanly beats Nick Garcia first. Eskandarian, only a second-year pro, now has more playoff goals than anyone else on DC squad. Lost the contact. I think something was going on there. He just popped it out. He handed it to a couple of people on the sideline. Nick Lee didn't. That was it. And that was it there for uh, Escondera. He's got two. Kansas City's going to appeal for a handball. But how about that for your day? You see, he's trying to clear this ball. Runs right into his chest. But this is just cool finishing. You see, you see Bo Shani leading the wrong way. That's a handball. Yeah. And as a, a referee, it is probably somewhere 40, 45 yards away from the goal. This a handball. is a handball. It's a handball. His arm is going up. It has to be intentional, but when your arm goes up like that, you will get called. Moreno. DC up two to one. They trailed one to nothing earlier. Stewart, nice run into the box. Looks, played it across. He's got three. I'll tell you what, that, that may have been an own goal. Oh, I thought Escadero touched it. No? Well, we'll take a look at it, but this is what I'm talking about. This the DC United is not going to take their, their foot off the accelerator. And now that this is, this is a nightmare for Kansas City. As you see, you, you get these one-on-one -on -one battles of Ernie Stewart. Oh, that's you're an right. Own goal. Own goal, right. And that's and that's a tough spot for a for a, a defender. And, and I always say this, as a, as a, a winger, this is a great. This is just experience. You you just throw that right in front of the net. Defenders are running towards their own goal. He's helpless, absolutely and completely helpless. There's nothing you can do about this defender. You can't blame him. It's just experience out of Ernie Stewart. Some people don't understand that, and I don't expect you to understand it, but that guy's played in three World Cups. He knows what he's doing. Ready for the corner is Kansas City. Into the middle. Romano got one hand on it. The net was empty. And a takedown in the box that was not seen. Sent into the middle. Headed down. Romano swats it once. And that was cleared somehow away. They're claiming a handball again. When you see that many guys, that many guys hit the referee. They saw, now they saw something he's going to call a penalty. He, pointed. he yeah. also has to do one more thing. He has to throw out the player that hit the ball with his hand. That's just an unfortunate rule. That was too quick for me. That was like ping pong. If they're calling a handball, they're going to have to throw somebody out. You see Jimmy Conrad, we expect him to be in there. The punch comes away. Jimmy Conrad hits this. 
It's Dima Kovalenko. Yeah. Well, they'll sort this out, but it is Dima. As soon as they find out who it is, the red card's coming out. And this game is going to change yeah. dramatically. There's that back pocket, and there's the red card. There it is. Yeah. Uh, how can Dima say who me? It was his arm. Who's well, he going to blame it on? Somebody else? <laughs> Josh Wolf. Josh Wolf has brought Kansas City back on the penalty kick. Great time to get your first career playoff goal. That's his first shot of the game. <laughs> he just, he did this right. He put it right in the corner. You see he made up his mind. Romano going the wrong way. There's a really good look at it. It's a good feeling when you realize the guy's going the wrong way and you, and you didn't miss. Here's some tank up giving it up. Zimogman leads it into space. Wolf is able to turn, cuts it back, Zimmel take up, left it, and Arno could not finish. And he's gonna th he thinks he was fouled by Ernie Stewart on this play. <laughs> Ernie showing no I can't there. repeat where he's gonna What a chance here. That's where you want it. Oh, Ernie did a great job. Great job of just getting a toe poke in there and making it miserable for him. Did you see this ball come right across the box? Romano would have been helpless. That little touch, just that little touch, made all the difference. And they've made reach. Ball poked forward. Taylor looking, shooting it low. Raimondo holds on. Seconds away from calling DC United champions again. I hear the black and red faithful. Chanting DC United. That's it. That's it. DC United are champions again for the fourth time. And a word from our ABC stations. You're watching ABC Sports and the champions, DC United. Last year, the focus was on the San Jose Earthquakes, and they made the playoffs. Next year, the focus will be on the Chicago Fire. All season long. From February to Halloween next year. Everybody's attention is going to be on the Chicago Fire. That's number one. Chicago is a global city. Number two, soccer is a global sport. Number three, you add what I said for number one to number two, and you have number three, where it's a global city should never struggle in a global sport. It is a complete embarrassment when a global city is not performing well in a global sport. So it's not only a, a, an embarrassment uh, when it comes to soccer, but also basketball. But I'm not going to talk too much about uh, the Chicago Bulls. You see, what? Well, I think the Chicago Fire understands this. I think they understand this, but I'm just saying anyway. You're a major American city. When, when people outside of America think about the, uh, think about American major American cities, it's New York, Los Angeles, Miami, Chicago. And 
I don't even think it's any specific order. It's usually those four cities immediately comes to people's head when they when they think of American cities. New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, Miami. And it's in no particular order. Those are usually the four cities that come to people's mind. Now, I know people, people may think, what about some cities in Texas? No, people just think about Texas, the state as a whole. Well, when it comes to major American cities, typically the major cities that people automatically think about when it comes to major American cities, New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, Miami, and oh yeah, also, of course, Washington, D.C., the nation's capital. So the, the five major cities and districts. So when you see a team like the Chicago Fire always struggling, year after year after year after year, always struggling, it's unacceptable. And when you have an owner who did what he did at the end of last year, you know, the owner was basically sending a message because I don't know how it is in other countries, but American owners, the majority owners, they usually don't have a sit down interview with the social media department to, you know, send a message to the masses. I mean, Jerry Jones of the Dallas Cowboys, he typically does that every week, but that's rare. So what the Chicago Fire owner did at the end of last season with the sit down interview with the social media department. That is rare. But at the same time, he himself was sitting. He, he basically put the whole entire organization on notice last year. That there's an expectation. He doesn't want to be known as a loser. He doesn't want his organization to be seen as a loser anymore. So, 2025, all season long, the focus is going to be on the Chicago Fire. And when it comes to revival, which is the theme of this monologue, Greg Borhalter will be working with a chip on his shoulder. Not really to prove people wrong because he knows what he's capable of doing. But it's to more so make his critics look like a fool. Look and sound like a fool. Largely Random people on the internet who don't know much about the man, who don't know the amount of sacrifices that you have to make to be the best and to stay at the top. People don't know, people who don't know what you've gone through to be in the position that you're in, the countless hours that you had to put in to be at the top. They think the 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 position was just given to Burhalter that Burhalter knew some people and because he knew some people that's why he's at the top position. It's very disrespectful to to just think that people are privileged without knowing anything about the person. A lot of people think that Greg Berhalter is just privileged and he's friends with a lot of people in high places. That's why he got the position. But they don't know Greg Berhalter, the man. And in 2025, Greg Berhalter is going to show the nation who Greg Berhalter, the man, is. And we're all going to witness that. We're not waiting until 2026. We're not waiting until 2027. Because Greg Berhalter says, I'm ready to win championships now. So the first time he steps on that field, on Soldier Field, 
whether that's decision day or February 2025, the first day he steps on that field, soldier field, it's going to be business and expectation. It's going to be championships. Bringing championship soccer back to a global city that is Chicago, Illinois. Now, continuing this message about revival, there's a historical team on the East Coast located in another global city, well, global district, similar to Chicago. And, you know, this team has not been playing up to expectations. They haven't been living up to their end of the bargain and 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 being uh and being a successful legacy club and being the face of MLS like it's supposed to be. This team has allowed, you know, Atlanta to come and like new clubs like Atlanta to come and outperform them. Charlotte, New York City, Philadelphia. It also is allowed his arch rival, his arch legacy rival, the Columbus Crew. The Columbus Crew needs one more star to tie with DC United. And the clubs that have the most stars in the East. Now, LA Galaxy has the most stars overall in Major League Soccer with five. And in a second is, LA, is DC United. Columbus Crew has three. All they need is one more. And not only would they be tied with DC United, but by virtue of popularity in recent times, being more successful in recent times, the Columbus Crew will jump over DC United in being the most prestigious team in the East. At the beginning of this season, I told you, I sent a message to DC United and LA Galaxy that you have to take back what is yours. Both of y'all are the most prestigious teams in Major League Soccer. Both of y'all have gone through grueling years where we didn't even know, where y'all didn't even know if MLS would even survive past 9-11. So much uncertainty to make it to the 2020s. And you're still standing. Now, LA Galaxy, I mean, they took the message like instantly. And I haven't had much to say about them because if if I see a team that that takes the message well and and they're running with it and they're being successful, it's not much for me to say, but just keep doing what you're doing. But DC United, it's been real rocky this season. And here we are as we approach decision day for the first time ever this decade. DC United will be the center of attention. Why? Well, all the popular, all the other popular teams in MLS have already clinched a spot in the playoffs so they're safe on decision day for those of you who don't know uh, what decision day is I will just I will compare it to the religious analogy of judgment day 
That's what decision day is. Miami is safe. Columbus is safe. LA Galaxy is safe. LASC is safe. Seattle Sounders, safe. New York Red Bulls, safe. New York City, safe. Cincinnati, safe. And so now that all the other popular teams are safe, we're going to be looking at the teams that are not safe. Chicago's already out. Philadelphia's not safe. Atlanta's not safe. And also, D.C. United is not safe. And because D.C. United is the most prestigious club out of the group that is not safe, Philadelphia, Atlanta, Montreal, most people in the MLS world is going to be wondering, can D.C. United pull it off? And to a deeper level, what has been going on with D.C. United? And what caused them to be in this position where they're struggling to stay above the playoff line? What has caused D.C. United to struggle to stay above the playoff line? Because when you're the nation's capital, when you're representing the nation's capital, You're the face of America. And because you're the face of America, people throughout the world are automatically going to expect you to be the best. They're automatically going to expect you to be number one. But the question is, does DC United expect themselves to be the best? When DC United wakes up in the morning, do they view themselves as a champion or do they view themselves as a loser? So on decision day, this Saturday, the season finale of the 2024 MLS regular season on Apple TV, MLS season pass. We are going to be curious. The only team that's really going to be on our mind is really DC United because, like I said, all the other all the other popular teams are already in. They're already safe. I mean, of course, we're going to see if Miami can break the record, but we know we're going to see them again in October. We, we're not really sure about that for DC United. Now, let me briefly explain. What may have caused D.C. United to be in this position where they're struggling to stay above the playoff line? Somewhere between the last decade and this first half of the 2020 decade, the ship crashed. And most, if not all, people jumped off the ship. As a matter of fact, everybody jumped off the ship when the ship crashed. And the ship sunk. Everybody put their life jacket on, got on a a rescue boat, and they went straight to Europe. They didn't even stop by, you know, one of those local hotels to recover along I-95 or whatever, or the Beltway or whatever. Oh, no. As soon as they got back to shore, they hopped on another ship and went straight to Europe. But there is only one man who stayed in Washington, D.C. Because he said that he was going to rebuild that ship and he was going to bring dignity back to D.C. United. He said he was going to bring respect back to D.C. United. He said he was going to bring power back to D.C. United. He said he was going to bring back joy to the fans of D.C. United. And that man is Christian Benteke. 
And because of that, he is the only reason, in my opinion, that DC United has a chance to clinch a spot, clinch a wildcard spot in the playoffs. When DC United finally turns this thing around, and finally consistently stay above the playoff line every single year. This man, Christian Biduteke, who chose to rebuild a new ship in Washington, D.C. when the old ship crashed. The man who chose to stay in America and not run back to Europe, where things are more comfortable. He's more familiar with you know, his people in Belgium, and, you know, his family and, you know, his close friends. He chose to stay in America and rebuild the ship. And that's why DC United has a chance to make the playoffs on Saturday. And when DC United finally gets to a point where they're consistently staying above the playoff line, he will forever be known, not only as a DC United legend, but he will be credited for the turnaround in the nation's capital. This theme about revival is about dedication. Christian Teke is dedicated. It's about determination. All season long, Christian Teke has been determined to bring respect back to DC United. And even when he was suspended for a brief period this summer, he didn't allow that suspension to slow him down. He came back and played with even more fervor, played with even more passion, played with even more determination. Because he has been determined to revive this entire organization. Therefore, I'm giving him the credit. He deserves the credit. So, you know, when we're watching Miami possibly break the record, you know, someone will be figuring out what's going on with the L.A. boys. You know, others will be focused on their favorite team, you know, Atlanta, Philadelphia, see what's going on with them. Some will be focusing on Montreal and seeing if Joseph Martinez can carry them into the wild card. Many people will be, play, will be paying close attention to what's going on in Washington, D.C. To see this ship that has been rebuilt by Christian Venteke, the captain of the ship and before I close sticking to this theme of revival congratulations Charlotte FC for returning back to the playoffs young organization almost a similar situation with DC, in DC United where things just things would just, just look disastrous for Charlotte Charlotte has they got it together they found a way to get it together and they're also in the playoffs. Congratulations, Charlotte FC. Revival. Revival Saturday. That is the theme for this year's Decision Day. And in Washington, D.C., we're going to find out if this new ship that is being rebuilt, led by a captain, Christian Benteke, Captain Benteke. We're going to see if this ship is fully revived.